So thank you everyone for attending today's seminar. Uh, thank you for those of you who are joining us um, remotely. We're very excited to be able to, to have you in, in both places. Um, uh, my name is uh, Brianna Mezek and I'm the director of the Center for Social Epidemiology and Population Health here at the University of Michigan. Uh, I'm also the director of the Michigan Institute, uh, Michigan Integrative Wellbeing and Inequality Training Program, or MIWI, um, which is, uh, and Dr. Norman Sartorius, who I will um, introduce in a second, one, one of his titles is as a, is a mentor in this program. Um, so I, I was, when I was thinking about this introduction, like what I, what I was going to say, um, well, I guess I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you look at his CV, some of the things you would see. Um, so Dr. Sartori started his career with one of the most important studies in the field of psychiatric epidemiology, which is a seminal study, for those of you who've taken classes with me, a seminal study comparing um, or trying to understand why there were more cases of schizophrenia diagnosed in the United States relative to the United Kingdom. And there was sort of all of these ideas at the time, you know, about sort of differences in culture that might be explaining this. And his group demonstrated that it was just measurement error that there really were not differences between these two settings. And, um, and if that work in the 1970s hadn't happened, we probably would have been led down, who knows how long we would have been led down a rabbit hole of trying to explain why serious mental illness looks different in these two different contexts, and which would have turned out to be just completely fruitless. Um, so that's where he started. <laughs> he then goes on to um, conduct some of the first sets of studies of schizophrenia in lower and middle income countries, predominantly in India. Um, the primary findings from these studies was that people with serious mental illness, particularly schizophrenia, tend to, it tends to be less chronic in those, in those countries. And while we don't, full, or in lower middle income countries relative to higher income in Western countries, we still don't fully understand why that is the case. But part of it uh, certainly has to, or it likely has to do with sort of different social roles and the ability to like support recovery in a really holistic manner. Um, uh, he then goes on to found and lead the division of the uh, of mental health at the WHO, the World Health Organization, from 1977 to 1993, where he decides to slow down and become the scientific director of the World Psychiatric Association Global Program Against Stigma and Discrimination. Um, he has been recognized by many of our, his work and his contributions to the field have been recognized by many of our leading organizations. I will just name two. He's, uh, in 1980, he won the Raymond LaPouse Prize from the um, American Public Health Association. So for those of you who know about the mental health section, this is the most esteemed prize that one can, one can get from our section. Uh, he's also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Royal College of Psychiatry uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, most recently, he is the president of the International Association for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs, and he recently led the International Prevalence and Treatment of Diabetes and Depression Study, or Interpret DD, um, which is a 16-country, uh, two-year longitudinal study. One of the primary findings, well, of course, the, the data is still being analyzed, was that depression is very common across all of these different uh, international settings uh, among people with diabetes, but is, is almost always missed by clinicians. And this, um, this you sort of the challenge of treating um, people as whole <laughs> and when they have multiple things going on, um, in, in depression and diabetes is just one example, uh, is to me the, the kind of hallmark of his work um, and why it's been so influential in my own work. Um, I not had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Sertorius in person until he arrived here in the United States on Sunday. Um, and I've had the pleasure of getting to show him our beautiful campus because the water, or sorry, the weather has cooperated. Um, and, and all I can say is that they um, they say, don't meet your heroes. And I would say, don't meet your heroes unless your heroes tend to be, or happen to be Norman Sartorius, and then you should meet them as frequently as possible. <laughs> so um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Norman Sartorius to the University of Michigan. Thank you very much. Yes. You have said so many nice things. Uh, reminds me of a colleague of mine who was a very pious man, and he was uh, introduced to somebody, uh, into a, to a group of people, and then he said, uh, do I have to do something? I think you should. Just... Thank you. 
And he was also introduced by the host, General Stern, and then he finished it. He said that uh, as I was listening to this, I really wanted to, to pray to God, he said, to forgive that person for saying all these things which are not necessarily all true. But then at the same time, I'm also praying to God to forgive me for enjoying it. So much. <laughs> um, right. I, I think that I would like to, uh, if I may, I will not speak for too long. But, uh, I hope that there will be some time for discussion and questions, and you might guide me to the territory that you feel is of greatest interest to yourselves. And I think that before I start talking about uh, medicine and psychiatry in the future, it's important to uh, remember uh, and think a little bit about uh, the major trends which are currently of great relevance for medicine and for psychiatry. And I'll say a few words about each of them and say why I believe that they are of great importance. Let's start with urbanization. It's become more rapid than it ever was. And uh, if you take a country such as Argentina, there are about 95% of the total population is in towns. And what is more is these people have not been there for a long time. Most of them admit they've arrived in the last 20 years. So that the, uh, there are huge influx. And the first consequence of this rapid urbanization is that the concept of the community as we have originally uh, thought has disappeared. Uh, these are people who live next to each other, uh, who have come maybe from different parts, who speak a slightly different language, who don't trust one another, and they are certainly not likely to help one another. Urban settings do not have communities as we have originally envisaged them and uh, thought about them. If you think that, for example, uh, when Dr. Riesinger came back from Egypt in 1842, he said it's ridiculous to have patients keeping them in hospital when they have a family, they can live with a family in the community, the community will help them, etc. This is 1842. Since then, we've gone a long time, and this community, which was the origin of community care, has vanished. It's not there anymore. I'm always giving one example because I think it's wonderful. It's we are living in a nine-story uh, house, uh, and the only person after 10 years of being in that house who I know is a fellow who has a dog. And he takes the dog out for, for a walk in the morning, just at the time that I go to my office. And they, they have this fantastic conversation, like, how are you today? It's raining again. This kind of a conversation. Now, I cannot imagine that this person would jump out of everything he does to help me if I had schizophrenia. It's just not on. He doesn't know who I am. I don't know who he is. And certainly doesn't care about me more than having these fantastic conversations in the elevator. <laughs> so I think that that is something that we should keep in mind. And the, uh, for uh, community care, as such, is no longer a viable strategy as we have thought it was before. We have to think about different style of community. Perhaps we have to think about creating communities around a particular problem. Uh, a beautiful example of that is a study that has been done by Annalisa Dupont many, many years ago. She discovered, uh, and I think she was very clever because her study was uh, done in a very special way. She asked women who had mentally retarded children, severely retarded children, what they did with their life. How often did they, for example, have sex with their husband? Do they read newspapers? When was it the last time that they went to a hairdresser? Did they buy themselves anything to, to put on or not? And the answer is no, 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 no. Their life as such was consumed with care for a child. They did it very well, but it was a uh, enormously time-consuming and life-consuming exercise. So she then said, all right, now let's maybe try to see this was rural Denmark. Uh, let's see whether we can get five of these mothers or six. Uh, and then maybe one or two of them could take care of the other five children for one day. And then they could roll it on like that. And it was an enormous success. These ladies were coming there, and the two of them were taking care of six children. Next day, they switched around. Suddenly, they started living again. And I think it was a beautiful example of creating a community for a problem. It didn't exist before. They hardly knew each other. But suddenly, they became helping one another, and they were a community in that sense. But there are many other ways in which you could try to construct communities again if you want to rely on it. You should pay them. There's no reason that we believe that we can keep the money and pass on the care. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you want me to care for you, give me the money to do it. So I think it would be logical to say that the money should follow the one who provides care. 
It should not stay in the hospital or in the government. The governments are delighted about deinstitutionalization because they're saving a lot of money by not having to pay anything for the, for the hospitals. But they are not paying anything, period. They're not now taking this money and giving it. it one would expect that, for example, if you have a uh, person who's looking after another person, that in one way or another, they would be uh, uh, compensated for it, maybe in giving extra time or maybe giving money or being something else. Uh, but they get nothing, and they are getting very tired. And it goes not only for the sick people, it also goes for healthy people. And it goes not only in countries which are rich, but also in the poor ones. Recently, China, which has always been proud about its ancestor worship and looking after parents, etc., has passed a law which severely punishes any child who does not want to look after their parents. Uh, when they get elderly. And this is a law which in fact has been passed because a huge proportion of parents, elderly parents, although they had children, were completely neglected in town. 70% of the widowers, for example, in Beijing have to hire somebody to look after them, although they have children in the same town mm -hmm. and grandchildren in the same town. So I think that that is uh, to, to think about the way in which one would help them and do something for them is uh, something that we should uh, uh, think about in terms of urbanization, which makes it all worse than it. Even in Bangladesh, they had to pass a similar law, which obliges the children to look after their parents uh, when they're elderly. Now, the fact that uh, the urbanization has destroyed much of the relationship is also has another factor which goes with it, and that is the factor of uh, uh, that the families have become much smaller, so that the burden of sharing that normally share among several members of the family now falls on one person only, which leads to the epidemic of burnout of carers, which has been described beautifully by the Australian researchers who have looked at the care of the elderly, showing that in fact many of the people who will be looking after elderly, demented parents, etc., have uh, not only uh, symptoms of burnout, but they also have a significantly higher proportion of people with physical illness they also feel sick because they're exhausted and uh, nobody looks after them properly. Now, another thing that is uh, a little bit counterintuitive is the, uh, oh yes, uh, maybe I should just say also the, uh, another thing, I'm, I'm enjoying the, the quote by uh, the Archbishop of uh, uh, Edinburgh, who said, we are gradually moving, moving into an area, into a time of serial monogamy. Mm -hmm. um, so that people keep having other partners. That's okay, I mean, quite amusing as well. But mm -hmm. at the same time, the child has three, four or five mothers or fathers in the course of his growing up. And that is not so easy to, to swallow. And that these children are growing up in these very disready, deranged, uncertain families for a long time. And equally so, the situation of these frequent divorce rates also makes care for sick members a great problem as well. Um, and then there is this uh, un unusual phenomenon, which probably was also the due, uh, which also been the cause for the COVID epidemic. That is that uh, as deforestation progresses and as towns occupy more and more space, most of the small animals of the forest, in fact, look for a new habitat. And many of them find it in town. They move to town. And as they move to town, they come together with their diseases. And she, uh, the uh, bats, which are in their immunological system very similar to humans, are wonderful carriers of these various causes of disease uh, and are transmitting them to humans as well. There are about 40 of them, they say, viruses which are waiting for them in, in a queue to come and get it to humans, which are much larger and uh, better, provide better food for them. But it's, it's really a, a huge amount of new diseases for which we are completely unprepared. And the recent epidemic of uh, uh, Corona has in fact demonstrated how miserably prepared most governments of the world are to deal with an epidemic uh, of, of serious proportions. And then also there is of course the proportion of contagious diseases, which we are not talking about at all. For example, tuberculosis is a sharp increase and it's a sharp increase of therapy resistant cases. And not only that, but as you will know, as Vakeon has shown and others, uh, the spread of tuberculosis depends very much on the floor space of the apartment in which you live. And most of the people now who are in fact have moved to towns where the space on which they live is smaller, and therefore the probability of transmitting disease is significantly higher. 
Now, of course, there are positive sides about the organization as well. It's uh, it's all within reach if you have the money for it, uh, etc. I mean, it's it has many advantages. The water is cleaner normally than it would be in many places, and many other advantages uh, which are undoubted, which has been also the reason for the project. Then there is this second trend which I mentioned at the beginning, and that's a word that is a neologism invented by typically by an Australian who works at the World Bank at the time, and he said this is something that we should think about. Commoditification is, he says, a tendency to consider everything as a commodity, like sugar or, uh, or iron or uh, any one other commodity, which means that you pay to get it, and having paid for it, you want to have it and you can sell it, etc. So that health, which was previously an ethical imperative for society, has become an economic opportunity. The more you pay, the more you get. And the growth, explosive growth of private care in the poorest countries of the world uh, is now a demonstration of that. They provide outstandingly good service for those who can pay for it. And the prices are for the situation, for the countries in which they are enormously high. Uh, they are still a little bit lower than they would be, for example, in this country or elsewhere, but uh, they are very much too high for anybody. That also affects who will work in public health and who will work in, in the government service, because the young graduate who finishes a doctor, he uh, first looks for a private institution which will employ him because he will give very good care, he will have all the facilities, all the apparatus and everything, and in addition, he'll be paid very well. Now, should he fail to get that position, he will then go to another country like the United States or England or some other place, because there again, he has a greater income and so forth. And anybody who fails in get these better positions is not available for the national health system, which means that the quality of care in the national health system has gone down over the years because it's been a negative selection of people who work in it. And that is, of course, uh, not very helpful either. And now, there is a, uh, uh, the additional problems with, uh, with this commoditification is also that the longer lasting a disease, the longer lasting the protection of the disease, the less interested governments are in treating it because they're unlikely to recoup the money uh, after the person gets well again. Uh, and that will, since most of the diseases with which you are now having to deal are diseases of very prolonged course, it really makes healthcare much more miserable. And then there's a question, the question of sorting capital, which is a uh, so very important and has been present, particularly, I think, in the after the Second World War, in which people are willing to contribute to the good of the community and Grows, then willingness to contribute to the community has been significantly reduced in everybody, and includes also that it's a, it's a factor that also we should keep in mind. Digitalization, well, that I don't want to spend too much time on it, except that, it, that in addition to all of the other wonderful things it did, it also contributes massively to dehumanizing medicine. Medicine is becoming dehumanized. You deal with figures and you deal with numbers and you people have disappeared behind these numbers. And the doctors now complain because they have to spend a huge amount of time to, uh, to put data in, and then their data are in, but they don't want them. They don't need this data. I mean, 90% of a good treatment is in fact in the human relation with the person who is in front of you. It's not seeking a variety of other sources, although it's helpful, but it's not the main goal. Uh, still, uh, the uh, dehumanization is progressing, and so is digitalization, and it has a bad effect also people who are old, like myself, uh, and others who are poor, because to use the possibilities and the potential of the digital age, you have to know how to handle machines. You, I, my granddaughter, she uses them with great ease. She sits there and taps into it, and I mean, everything works. <laughs> and I sit there like an idiot and say, but please, could you help me? She's 10 years old. And um, she sometimes, yeah, all right, I'll help you. But oh, wait a little. I mean, it's the, con the consequence of all this. There is a, um, in my case, I'm fine because I have them, although they are reluctant to, to guide me, they do. But many people who are elderly don't have anybody to guide them and help them to get the advantages of the digital age. They are, in fact, deprived of that. Not to mention that in many countries, to buy a computer is not everybody's affair. And to not only buy one, but to have upgraded it and upgraded it and make it co with things is not a necessarily thing that way. 
And I think that that's something that is very important. And of course, it's wonderful to have the digital era for research because it allows you to have this huge data sets, etc. But I must say that the number of revolutionary discoveries since the digitalization has happened have been miserably small. Uh, in fact, many more revolutionary changes have happened by somebody who has been thinking rather than looking at data. Demographic changes, yes, I think that that's been with us for a little while, so it's not a new phenomenon, but it's not improving either. We're getting more and more people of old age with all the old age pathology that goes on. It's additionally giving extra weight to the urbanization problem that I mentioned before. It includes the, uh, also it increases the cost for care because the elderly normally have more than one illness and once you have them in treatment, you want to deal with more of them. So all of this, but the main thing, which is I think very often forgotten is uh, that the, all the things that were normally previously done in a family that was composed of a variety of ages are not done anymore because these families have now become single age families. They are now the elderly living in one place and the young ones are living in another place, etc. And the transmission is very minimal. Now, there is another phenomenon which is tremendously important, and that is what has been called the horizontalization of the world. Uh, the communication that exists is, in fact, now passing on horizontally. People of the same age or same age group, they speak to one another. Not only do they speak to one another, but they speak to one another in a language that only they understand. And I don't understand them anymore. Neither do the younger nor the, young, the older. They are living in that particular layer. Uh, and I think that is worldwide so that a uh, person, an adolescent who lives in Geneva, understands the adolescent in China without any difficulty. But he doesn't understand his father any longer, not to mention his grandfather, because the vertical communication has become minimal. Not only has it become minimal, but it's also become considered as being of lesser value, not something that one should seek. And so many of the problems that previously were resolved in the family by relying to on some member of the family, the more experienced or older, whichever, they were gone. They, they can't speak to the elderly anymore because the elderly doesn't understand them. They use words. They are the French, they count everything, but the French have now counted the number of new words because they have this special academy, the French Academy of Sciences, which examines all the new words that arrive and then considers whether it should include them into the French language or not. <laughs> and they discovered now in the last few years, the number of new words, which they don't know what to do with, is growing all the time because each of those horizontal layers produces their own languages. And these languages are not comprehensible across uh, the, the structure. And that is of course, uh, creating a situation in which you have panic, which happens in a particular layer, like it was the case with, uh, with COVID now, most recently we've seen panic waves that have been spread in a particular thing or notions that went through Facebook lines that have been there and so forth. So it's a very important and, and unfortunately uh, uh, consequence of what we are having. It also changes the relationship between doctors and patients because the doctors of a certain age don't understand the children or the adolescents of another age. They don't know what they are talking about. And the, the adolescent doesn't know how to speak to the doctor. You don't understand them. And they, they sit each to each other and then they speak. And it's, a, it's a, what they would call really a, an interview between two deaf persons. Both speak, but none understands anything. And I think that is something that is also tremendous importance. And the quality of health care has been uh, also diminished by the horizontalization. I think a few days ago, I mentioned the uh, study by Muriel Hammer in New York some years ago. Uh, she uh, has wanted to see to what an extent the difference between social class, uh, between the doctor and the patient, influences the probability that the person will get a different diagnosis. And she found that in fact, the larger the difference in social class between doctor and patient, the more probable is the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And they are, if they are social class one and four, the probability of schizophrenia was, I think, three times higher than if they were of the same class. The classes spoke a different language. Uh, now it's not only the classes, now it's the age groups and other horizontal arrangements which use the same language and are not comprehensible by others. And the great success of the recent uh, efforts that have been done in, in Australia, for example, with the uh, um, uh, safe space 
um, programs in which adolescents have a place to which they can go if they have troubles, somebody there with whom they can speak, etc. But it's their own age is the defining thing on the door. If you have a certain age, you go there. And it's been a miraculously successful. Many of the problems have been resolved because they come to these places and they speak and they understand them because they are in there, there are people who are of the same language area with the same class language, if you wish. And of course, um, the, uh, the same is true now. We, we, the social classes that which are previously the main for now is age as well, which goes horizontally. Within an age line, uh, for example, stigma will flourish. And the, no matter how much you do, unless you speak the language of that particular layer, you get no matter. So that in probably one would have to think of four or five different expressions for the same message if you really want to reach the population. And that's important in fighting stigma because you have to have a harmony between those who live in the same place. And you can't get the harmony if only one-fifth of the population understands what you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. and then there is this uh, problem, a uh, general problem of what has been called de-civilization. I think it's fair to say that de-civilization can be measured by the amount of care that the society gives to its feeble members, to its children, to its elderly, to the unwell, etc. And most countries now have seen a decrease of civilization, the process of decivilization, which is demonstrated, for example, by an increase of child mortality in rich countries uh, and by a number of other factors which have been present. And I think it's also decreased the amount of provided care to the uh, people who have been impaired in one way or another. And uh, I think that the uh, whole question of, uh, of stigmatization has got another boost uh, out of that. Now, about 70 years ago, uh, a uh, French sociologist wrote a wonderful book, which was called The Fragmentation of Labor. The Fragmentation of Labor was, he wanted to explain why many of these uh, workers are unhappy when they get home in the evening. And he said the main reason why they are unhappy is that labor has become fragmented. You never proceed the product of what you have done. You participate in the process, but labor is fragmented. A fellow, a shoemaker who takes a piece of uh, leather, produces a shoe and sees the shoe is happy because he's produced a shoe. But a fellow who is, the, is in the factory and who hits the hammer on each thing that goes in front of him, sees nothing. He's never seen what he's produced, zero. He's a sterile person, uh, sterile in his work, sterile at his home, sterile everywhere. And I think that, that fragmentation of labor has been a, a wonderful book that I think has influenced many. But now we are seeing that fragmentation is becoming general. Medicine, for example, is fragmented. Its fragmentation is terrible. And uh, now there are people, I always quote one person, so uh, uh, this is a, you know, airplane, I was sitting next to a person and we were talking and then what are you doing? I'm, I'm a surgeon. Oh, I'm a surgeon, wonderful. We, we have, you don't know what to ask a surgeon. Mm -hmm. So I asked this surgeon, I said, what is your speciality? Ah, he said, my speciality is the right thumb. <laughs> I don't understand. Which is, no, 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 no. He says, I'm doing the right thumb. I'm a surgeon, a hand surgeon, and the right thumb is, the, is my speciality. Oh, and I, uh, I said, is it, uh, and is it, oh yes, he said, because he can charge extremely high because he does complicated thumbs, hand is important, etc., etc. So he is a thumb surgeon. Now, there are other surgeons that are operating on other pieces. So there are also already the whole of surgery is split, but psychiatry is the same. And now we have child psychiatry, which don't speak to the adult psychiatry, which don't speak to the elderly psychiatry. And then there are early intervention psychiatry and young intervention psychiatry, and, and so on it goes. And they are not talking to one another. They don't understand one another. They speak a language that the others don't understand. They are now split in a thousand pieces. Partly this is due to the fact that you have to learn much more because more knowledge is available. Partly because the salary or the income of a top specialist is incomparably higher than somebody who is just doing good to his patients. 
because this is a very big difference between them. So I think that the fragmentation has also led to another phenomenon, and that is the epidemic of burnout. Because as a doctor, you never see also the product of many of your patients, because they go into you and then you give a consultation uh, to uh, some patient, and he goes away, you never see him again, ever. So what, are you, what have you done? You gave advice to somebody whom you don't know, who's gone away? Mm -hmm. I don't know what happens with them. So the gradually fragmentation has led to this very large increase, 50% of young psychiatrists in Europe now have burnout syndromes. And in New York, uh, the paper that has been published, which has been particularly striking as well, is not only burnout, but a very high utilization of psychotropic medications by uh, residents uh, who are supposed to be delighted by what they're doing, but they're not. And I think that to a large extent, it's the fact that you do not know what you're doing. You're just contributing something all the time. But, I mean, in an emergency service, you see the patient and people say we are delighted to have some emergency services because we do something and then we pass the patient on. I have no more. But while they, this is very nice not to have any responsibility, it's also terrible because you never see this patient again coming to you. Say, oh, doctor, how oh, lovely that I could see you again. Uh, you have saved me at the time I had a big uh, headache or whichever. So the previously, the doctor who was there, he was, in fact, having patients who recognized that he was a doctor and that he was important, he helped them. And I ah, helped my child and thank you very much, etc. But that one is gone to a large extent out of medicine. You know, the doctors uh, don't know their patients any longer. And uh, there was a recent, very nice little study in which they asked uh, doctors to quote five names of patients in the last week and none of them could do it. Uh, it's, it's because they are not linked anymore. There are many patients who come, they look at them, there's a file, no, and the electronic file and everything else, and the electronic file comes in, with the file comes the patient, you operate the thing, and it goes out. You don't know who this person was, where he comes from, does he have a mother or father, who knows? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that has really led to a bad, bad development of medicine. Now, then, of course, I, I mentioned some of the major trends, and there are others which are local. I'm sure that in your work in the United States, there are other trends which are prevailing and which are important, and they are similarly in other countries as well. Those that I mentioned are fairly universal, uh, and uh, I think that they are present in practically everywhere. Now, we shouldn't be depressed uh, about all of this. There are developments which are positive. I think that it's very likely that we will, by nano industry and by uh, whatever it's called, the artificial intelligence and by all the other fantastic things, we will produce new medications, new tools, new ways of living. Everything will be found undoubtedly, yes. But, uh, <laughs> and it's also very probable, it was done, two studies have been done now, to examine the productivity of an individual uh, in the course of years. And they say that it's, although we are now 8 billion people in the world, the productivity of an individual working is growing much faster than the total number of people for whom they are producing. So that's the, on the positive side, the productivity will go up and I think we can all be happy about it. And maybe, I do not know, but maybe people will do something about uh, climate and about uh, various other terrible things that are all there. We all like talking about it, but it's very difficult to really get engaged in this. But maybe there will be a change and people will start uh, doing the right thing about the environment and about uh, uh, human-made diseases and human-made problems. Now, what about the future psychiatrists and the future doctors? Uh, I think that they, although they will learn a great deal with uh, new knowledge, there are certain things which they will have to learn which they don't know now. One of them is uh, they will have to think about dealing with comorbidity. The, extended, the um, extension of their life expectancy and various other factors leads to the increased probability that people have comorbid diseases, the physical and the mental disease very often at the same person. At present, uh, the physical and the mental, because of the fragmentation of medicine, are dealt with different people. And I think that we will probably have to think of educating the doctor differently and make him remember that he is a medical practitioner and not a uh, specialist in something. So that when a person comes to the psychiatrist, 
It may be that early in the course of their interaction, uh, the psychiatrist will say, all right, now please take off your clothes. I'd like to examine you. I mean, this would be uh, considered uh, unbelievable if it happened today because the psychiatrist uh, and also other doctors, they don't really undress their patients any longer. They, I don't know, they, they have a rentgen eyes or something and they know everything. But I mean, it would be necessary that a psychiatrist remembers that he is a doctor and that the other doctors remember that people have minds and hearts and feelings and that they have to deal with both at the same time. Um, the other one, avalanche of problems that will come our way is the problems which were previously resolved by someone in the family. A grandmother that was producing a chicken soup of special qualities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when she did it, every disease disappeared mm -hmm. and so forth. There are a number of things which the uh, grandmothers have been doing, grandfathers less frequently, but grandmothers <laughs> have been very good uh, in time. And they have been resolving problems, also emotional problems. There was always somebody most families, large families, there was somebody to whom you could go and complain and understand and listen and get advice and so forth. Another problem that we will have to understand is that the, since I've mentioned to you earlier, the communities are falling apart. The burden on the carer is bigger and bigger. And we will have to think of how to help the carers much more than we do now. We have to educate them. We? No. They have to be educated. By whom? Well, they should be educated by other carers and doctors and patients. They should have a different style. And I mean, I was struck by my uh, um, niece. Uh, she, uh, a very lovely girl, and uh, she wanted to have a child, but they couldn't. And uh, so they finally decided they would adopt a, a child. And then they went to the authorities and they said, we'd like to do that. And the authorities said, yes, very good, you have to go to this course and then uh, when you, uh, you pass certain exams and then after that uh, you so they went and they did the course six months they learned all sorts of things they went there they passed the exam they went and uh, now uh, are having a little child which they have adopted now i ask you how many normal mothers go six months training before they have their first child <laughs> six months full-time training hey no look they, they are all all women and all men in the world are God given know what to do with small children. They don't. <laughs> I mean, in some countries it was done a little differently. In early days, when I was first went to Mongolia many years ago, there was a special system. There was a, a, a lady, usually a lady on a camel uh, or an, on a horse, which was going around. And then when she saw a pregnant woman, she would say, You will come with me, please. And then they would take this pregnant woman to a what was called a maternity award and this lady would come there together with them and they were training them there i was amazed because at that time uh maybe this doesn't mean anymore but i, I remember on the wall there was marie Curie picture angela davis <laughs> so they were training them not only about how to uh, give care to a child but also how to think of who they are and what is their personality their role in mongolia is easy to do this because women have a very particularly important position but it was nice that they thought about it put there so for three weeks they were trained about this child how to get it how to what to do it how to clean it etc and then now comes the nicest of them all uh, then they were allowed now the time was come to take their child and go home but before they could go home the husband had to come and spend a week doing also child care bathing the baby and uh, doing this that uh, everything falls out of your hand if you're a decent father and, and you don't know how to do it but they trained them a little bit and they prepared it for it we are not doing it for carers we are not preparing the carers how to look after other people we are not preparing this for parents either parenting skills are miserable in most parts of the world to resolve things antenatal and perinatal care which one would expect will be a main carriers of information and help for people are not carrying anything they look whether you have a depression but having a depression is not the main issue in pregnancy there are many other things what women worry about whether their husband will go somewhere where he shouldn't be going and they do not know what will happen there is not enough money for the child i mean thousand other things which they have to resolve they have to have somebody who will advise them do it it's not happening and psychiatrists and psychologists in most parts of the world are totally absent from perinatal care zero 
And I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, women who are in, expecting a baby are particularly careful in accepting any information. And uh, if it's an occasion where really people do listen to what you have to tell them, doesn't it? Now, I think that the physician will have to also uh, uh, start thinking on how to deal with all these machines which they have, because they have so many machines, but they would have to learn how to use them properly. And when, because the machines will replace them very soon. And many of these things that we are now taking as granted, I think, uh, uh, are like that. But they will also have to learn that most of the healthcare is defined not by the doctor, but by the government, by what is the provided to the population, to what an extent the population have access to certain types of health support, money, etc care and particular interventions. So if a doctor has to be, wants to be uh, useful, he will also have to learn how to speak to people who are organizing the world. How do they speak to people who are in government? How do they speak to ministers or to local uh, authorities? They don't know. They're produced as doctors. They know how to deal with uh, in diarrhea, but it, they, they don't know how to convince their local uh, authority, local administrator, about the terribly important measure that should be taken. So I think that that's something that they will have to, and they will also have to probably remain interested in supporting, which they are not doing at present, supporting research which speaks about how useful it is what they're doing at present. So if, all the, if you want to do this, we'll have to probably completely change the way in which doctors are selected. It's not, being a doctor is not the same as being any other profession. It has certain advantages, certain disadvantages, and requires certain things. And there are extremely few medical schools which, in fact, do a detailed assessment of wishes, ideas, expectations, and also knowledge and personality of people who will become future doctors. We should make it easy for people who start medicine and don't like it too much to switch to something else. Because some of them start and they're okay at the beginning, but then they stop being okay and they want to go somewhere else and they can't because they're now already spent three years of their life and now they will continue and they'll become truly miserable doctors when they are finished. Mm -hmm. I think we should also think about uh, all of the legislation concerning health and make sure that every single law has a sunset clause. Sunset clause which says this law is valid two years, like on a tin of uh, cherries. And after that date, this law is no longer valid. We have to look at it. Maybe things have changed. Think of the fact that, in, for example, in Senegal, they are having a mental health law, which is almost like that copy of the 1898 copy of the French law on mental health. 1898. And I mean, uh, uh, Senegal. But most of the European countries have not revised their laws properly. Uh, until scandals happen. When the scandal is happening, then they revise. But before that, but they should, in fact, look at the laws uh, with sunset clauses every time. We should say, this law is valid until such and such a date, then let us examine it again. And not only laws, but regulations. Equally so, regulations within uh, the health system as exist. They should also start thinking maybe some of the old things which we were doing before, like washing hands uh, after you've been to the toilet. That's sort of a disappeared as a normal, very expected thing. I don't know how many people say this, but I know that most children don't wash their hands any longer after they've been to the toilet. Maybe they are now doing their toilets in ways that are yet undescribed, but I mean, it would be nice if they wash their hands, but they don't. And there's a number of other things that were previously included in elementary health education, uh, which should be revived, and I think which should be put in there. They, they have vanished altogether. And the ignorance levels about what you should do if a uh, uh, snake bites you or whatever else are just unbelievable. And then I think that it's also important to remember that stigma of mental illness or any other stigma is created at the age of three or four years. By four years, you have created your concepts. Um, it's like, you know, there is all these animals at the age of two or three, some are very big, some are very small, 
Some are run fast, some don't run fast, some are nice, some are not. All of them have one thing in common, and that is they bark. They bark. And hence, anything that barks is a dog. Mm -hmm. And that concept formation is finished by the age of four. Mm -hmm. Equally so, all people who are mentally ill have one characteristic, they're dangerous. And the child knows that they are dangerous by the age of four. It's very early that they prejudices, very early that the opinions, because concept formation helps you to understand the world. If you have to remember for every bloody dog what his name is, there are, I don't know many, how many thousands of all different species, you die knowing nothing but these dogs. <laughs> and, uh, present, I think the notion is, no, we will do stigma programs when they are adults. Very difficult, very unlikely that we'll have great success. It's the parental home where stigma work has to be. It's the first class of in primary school where children should play and learn in playing how to accept a person with disability, any disability, mental or physical. And if you do it, we've done it in Pakistan, it works like a dream. It's not only do they learn that this is different, but they go home and educate their parents. They say, no, 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 you can't do this. I, my teacher has told me, etc. So they really, it's an early time. It's this period between four and seven or eight years where we shape the relationships with other people who are different from ourselves. And I think that's a time which we should use incomparably better. Now, uh, I think that uh, education, postgraduate and undergraduate education, one of the things that I think is of particular importance is to think of ways in which we can train people together. We should train people separately, but we should also have a period in which the nurses and the social workers and the lawyers and medical students are trained together. Not only because they learn the same thing, but because also if they are being taught together, they will respect each other a little bit more than they do at present. At present, all of the medical professions, all of the professions dealing in health, hate each other uh, in the lung. <laughs> they, uh, and they know that the others are miserable. And they want them. Knowledge is clear. <laughs> um, I think that there should, there's also the question of in-service training, which should not be made as a terrible thing, but maybe people could organize their postgraduate in-service training in a nicer way, in which it would be more in the form of or the friends we get together once a week, maybe to talk a little bit. And learning in this way would be of tremendous importance. It's very rarely happening at present. It's usually very formalized, which means that you have to reorganize your life to attend something. No, it should be in the last hour of the working day for half an hour, talk about what is new, maybe. That would be acceptable. It would not harm people. Um, we should also think that carers, in fact, do a fantastic work. They do 90% of the care. We tell them something, but the care is done by them. So why not invite them to teach? I am I'm looking all the time to see which of the departments of psychiatry invite carers, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, or people with schizophrenia to come and teach how do you look after a person with schizophrenia? Because you don't look after a person with schizophrenia. You just examine them. You give them a diagnosis. You give them a treatment. Goodbye. And occasionally they are on a ward, you're not looking after them either, because it's the nurses who look after them, and you as a doctor don't. You just take this extra position, the pen in your hand, you write down things. I mean, that's not the way to do it. And I think that would be something really, on one hand, improving training, but on the other hand, also recognizing that the job that the carers do is valuable and makes them people with special knowledge and people who we should respect for what they're doing. And then we should think also ways in which we uh, can switch careers. Because, uh, you know, you, you get to the age of, uh, shall we say, uh, 32, 33, and you discover that your job stinks. <laughs> I mean, it really stinks. You know what you want. But now to go to another job, that's a, the work of a hero. You have to restart again with students of no age at all, and you have to take all the misery, and uh, now you're aware of that misery because you're an old person, but previously you thought it was normal. So uh, you go up there, and now, instead of that, we should think of ways in which one can switch careers if they don't work very well. We should think of ways in which we can allow people to move into an area which is more easy. And then we should also, of course, uh, 
think about education, about health, I already mentioned this a little bit. And I think that the, uh, the main thing about selecting people for healthcare in general is by their personality, by the way, the, the extent to which they can and are willing to uh, do something with empathy for people around them. In, I think I recently read a mention to somebody uh, about this little book that came out in New York and everybody seemed to like it, which is called The Rabbit Effect. The Rabbit Effect is a, uh, a, a all sorts of, the 75 pages are not very good, but the first two pages are very good. <laughs> the first two pages tell you the following. He said there was this uh, laboratory in which they were feeding uh, rabbits with a very bad diet, which had a lot of uh, um, fat and uh, I don't know other substances which you should did in order to examine to what an extent these bad diet produces uh, uh, heart problems, heart failure. And they gave this to a large number of rabbits, and all the rabbits were dying as they should, except for a small group of rabbits which did not seem to die. And they did eventually get sick, but much, much later. And some of them did not want to die at all. And they didn't know why this was, so they looked at the light, the same light, everything was there, except there was one thing which was different. And that was the difference that, in fact, one of the labor, lab technicians who was looking about rabbits loved rabbits. She just enjoyed being with them. So she would come there and she would talk to them a little bit. Occasionally she would play with them a little. Same food, same everything, except that she, she sang to them and uh, she tried to see whether they'd come to her, etc. They didn't die. Now, the book says there is more to empathy than just uh, that everybody can do it. It really was, so the book is written about that, how important are they, what has been called by Frank and others in the 1930s, the non-specific aspects of treatment, the willingness to get engaged in a different way with people whom you are treating, and the willingness to, to give them your heart when you are, when you are working with them. Um, Yes, I already mentioned about the uh, ways in which we could perhaps change uh, our care arrangements, uh, think about a replacement of the, uh, or rather compensation uh, given to people who provide community care, which will maybe attract them. Uh, think about ways of early preventing burnout. Many of these things, which I mentioned earlier, will lead to a major revision of care strategy, which we have to undertake if you want to be there. And I think that the, uh, system of, which was called in Germany, the Weglauf House. This is a uh, arrangement which they had in, in some bigger towns in Germany, in which a person who is having a, a, another episode of a serious mental illness, he doesn't have to go to hospital. He goes to another place, it's an apartment usually, in which there is one uh, nurse or sometimes a person with an experience of mental illness, and they come there and they spend three days in peace uh, without the problems at home. And many of them, in fact, recover these extra three days of holidays, if you wish, from everything, makes them capable to cope again. It's a simple arrangement, it does not cost anything, but it has been very helpful for many. And there are hundreds of similar examples which we are not respecting sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Little things which have been done, which we should seek out, write up, research, and make part of the normal education. Um, so now what about psychiatrists of the future? They are a particular group. I think that the one thing which they never learned how to do is how to use communication skills. They just don't know how to speak. If you go to most of the psychiatrists, they go to the television, the attitudes to psychiatry go down like that after they've spoken because they are so incompetent in public speaking. And it should, it doesn't come from, in some people, God has given you the capacity, but in most other people, you learn how to speak. If they train you, how to speak, if they train you to say one thing and not the other thing. And it's a matter of training more important for psychiatry than for other disciplines, because 90% of the work of a psychiatrist is convincing others to help the patient whom you have in front of you, in one way or another. You have to work with a group that will keep that person alive. The fact that you're prescribing a drug is an easy part of your job, but it's the rest which really makes make such a big difference. So that's one thing, they should learn communication skills and they should teach their patients communication skills. Most of the patients who have been uh, seen in, uh, in Ireland about 35 years ago have been incompetent in establishing contacts. And uh, 
two of the colleagues who were working at the time, they spent a lot of time trying to teach them how to be nice to other people. And it worked like a dream. For those that are in this particular course, the relapse rate was significantly lower uh, because they just found a way to be with other people without being uh, difficult. Uh, I mentioned also that the psychiatrists of the future will have to be competent in dealing with comorbidity, which is of great importance. Uh, it's expected that they will be technically competent in psychiatry, but that's always doubtful. Uh, <laughs> They should also be uh, thinking about what is the, how can I learn about society, about the communities sufficiently to be able to give reasonable advice to people who go out after they've been treating them. What should I tell them? How do they listen? What do they hear? And I think that's something that they should probably also learn. They should probably also think of ways to develop and involve people who have mental illness to help them to understand how things are done and what they don't know. I'll tell you an example which I think struck me very much. We did a study in some 20 different countries in which we asked uh, doctors, uh, young doctors, to ask the patient on exit, how was the treatment? How did you like to stay in hospital? And they got positive results. And some of them, however, they also asked them other questions like, what happened to you, etc. And at least two of the hospitals, um, the patients said they were beaten by, uh, by, by staff. Yet, when they were asked, uh, how was it, the treatment, they said fine. And they said fine because the outcome was positive. They came out of the hospital without the disease for which they went in there. And they were not quite sure whether maybe beating is part of the treatment, because nobody told them. So I think that the, uh, I'm mentioning this example because I think it's of such tremendous importance to really see what is, in, in what way we can uh, uh, listen to patients when they are telling us things about how to improve care, et cetera. Because very often there, are, there is some positive event which overshadows everything bad that happens in your own treatment of them. And I think one should learn about it and, and be aware of it a little bit more. So I think that the world of tomorrow will bring us many changes. And uh, I think that many things will change, but the need for empathy will remain the same. Uh, it is the central part of all our medical professions. And I think that we should probably start changing first ourselves and then the training of others. Uh, and so perhaps in the future, we'll have a better way of uh, looking after our patients and also uh, a better way of living with ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't we're on this webinar too, so I'm trying to think about how we should handle um, Q and A. Um, let's start. I guess let's start here in the room, and I'll I'll, I'll look at the. Um, the Oh, I, I think I've got the, I, I think I'm okay. Thank you though, I appreciate it. So um, thank you Alejandro for uh, keeping everybody there. So um, questions for registratory. I have a question. Yes, please. So um, you talk about artificial intelligence and there's a lot more innovation happening around chatbots and other sorts of just you know, completely computerized you know so like how do you envision <laughs> psychiatry reimagining their role given the you know I mean I think there's a lot of physicians who talk about well the computer will replace me it will enhance me it will augment me right but I guess um curious about your your thoughts on the overall adoption over time and like what that means for the fields. Can you, can you, can repeat, that, no, that, uh, can you repeat the question before you answer it? I'm sorry, just so everybody can hear it. Go ahead. Uh, I think that there are so many things which we have to do before we need artificial intelligence. For the moment, it contributes zero to what we are doing in psychiatry. What we have to do in psychiatry is to think about human rights. That's not something that artificial intelligence has to tell you. You have to remember what 
has been written 5,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago about how to handle people. And the first priority, in my opinion, is to improve the, the use of all things that we know are important before we start thinking we will now uh, protect human rights, for example, we will not beat patients using artificial intelligence, which will be a voice from, this, from, from the sky will say you don't beat. We don't need that. For most of the things in really improving healthcare, we don't we have enough knowledge, but we don't have enough application of the best knowledge which we're having. Now, having said that, it's of course wonderful to have this new opening for further research, for further understanding, etc. But I would go very slowly with this application because we are morally not right to use it. It's too powerful. It's like with big weapons. Uh, big weapons are uh, dangerous in the hands of children. And we are, in terms of artificial intelligence, children in the use of artificial intelligence. We don't know what it will do to us and how it will do it. So I would, I would go slow on its use uh, in practice. By all means, let's research, let's think about it, let's see what it can do, where its limits are, etc. But I would go slow uh, with influence. We will, unfortunately, we are not, we will not be able to prote protect uh, good medical care from it. Uh, people will invent uh, other things which will come and will be linked to artificial intelligence instead of saying good morning to the patient. Uh, you know, they will, in fact, introduce an uh, artificial intelligence uh, machine that will say good morning. That will cost a million dollars, the machine, and I mean, it will be just as uh, useless as most the other machines. Please go ahead. Please. Well, thank you very much for an amazing talk. Um, I'm I'm interested to hear from you about resilience, and do you do you believe that resilience can be enhanced at a later age, and in, uh, in adults or uh, older adults, and can yeah. resilience be also a negative thing sometimes? Well, if you're a bad man or bad woman, and you are resilient, very bad for you. <laughs> But um, I think that uh, for resilience as such, to a large extent, is also inborn. And in a way, uh, I think that we are much better served by very carefully selecting and helping people to select the job which fits them as they are, rather than to think, I'll put you into this job and then I'll teach you how to be resilient. If that job requires a lot of resilience and, and you don't have it, don't go into it. So I think that advice about what you should be or what kind of a job you should take. Because within each of our professions, there are many different sub-jobs which one could take. And it's, I think it's much better to seek something in which you fit rather than try to develop an extra feature that will help you to fit into that thing. Sometimes it's unavoidable. And for our patients, it's very often necessary to think about. Uh, resilience can be increased a little bit. You can raise a number of strategies which can be used. It's a lot of work. It's very hard work. It's a question whether you're using your time in the best way by enhancing resilience or doing other things like phoning the household, the, the, the house manager, not to throw the patient out of his room. It's, it's a matter of priority. I think that many of our interventions will bring results, but they invest, they, they require so much investment that you have to think of whether uh, some other thing is also useful. So yes, resilience when you can, uh, it's good to know about it, to know whether people are resilient. It's, there are techniques to improve it and enhance it. It's a lot of work to do it. And um, one should do it only after the other basic needs have been satisfied. Um, you were talking about burnout and about fragmentation among mental health providers. And um, I lead a large study in this area and we've had you know, any number of reasons for the complaints about, you know, health system, um, lack of supporting providers and, and other things. And I guess I'm wondering um, what your recommendations are that you think could work, because I feel like so often it puts the onus back on the individual. If you just did yoga, you did resilience training, you did whatever, it, you know, then your life would be better. Um, and, and that to me is just like putting the problem on the victim to some extent. And so, have you seen things that work or do you have recommendations on what might actually be um, sort of feasible, acceptable and work? <laughs> well, uh, there is a number of studies that Dr. Walton and his collaborators have done uh, trying to see what happens with the attitudes and the way in which doctors or 
students of medicine uh, develop over time. And he saw that uh, these uh, students in the first and the second year are full of humanism and uh, feeling for the social and uh, looking after people's hearts, etc., etc. And as they go on, we are gradually training them to lose all this. They, so that by the sixth year, they have become inhuman. Uh, thanks to our education. And I think that that's really the important thing which we have to remember, that the real doctor is created in the first two or three years of his studies. That's where he have made him. After that, it's just a receptacle of extra knowledge, skills, which he has. But the original attitude, which has to be at the core of the medical profession, is created very early in life and subsequently also very early in the medical study. So I would say that probably a very great point of emphasis should be in the first years of medical studies, where you really develop the attitude of the future doctor to his profession, to other people, to people with whom you work, to people who he treats, etc. And that's a fairly neglected area. You, you put into the first years of medical studies in most parts of the world, completely uh, in human subjects histology, no? anatomy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is this, the fact that you, that I to this day know that there are eight bones in this part of my head and I know name each of them has not made me more human. <laughs> it has in fact, uh, um, I just made me very proud that I could live, I would be had to do it and especially with the sack of bones to go in with a hand and you have to take out the bone and say what it is. So I could do this. I mean, did it help me to become a doctor? Better doctor? No. And I think that that really is the orientation of the medical studies and equally to so the orientation of the institutions in which you work. The first thing that people have to learn and the first priority they should be given is very probably there. Um, and there are numerous minor things that one has to learn. It is, for example, in my institution, not my institution, but the rule is when a patient gets into the door, into the through the door, you get up, stand there while he sits down. Not much, but it's somebody who stands up because he respects me, so he'll speak to you differently. And I think that there are a thousand things in which one should really think about the relationship, uh, which is independent from medicine, but so important for medicine. If the patient trusts you and respects you and you respect him, he will accept advice in a different way. He will not seek another alternative advice. He'll listen to you, etc. So I think that that's something that we should, and we should also learn, I mean, the shattering uh, recent studies that have shown that the average uh, duration before the patient is interrupted, uh, when he uh, speaks to the is, I think, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, you know, the patient comes through the door and says, I have a terrible headache, doctor. Before he can say another sentence, he says, since when? And then he says, but this has been last six months. And where is it? In front of you don't ever let. We've done one study, a small study, which uh, I think was quite uh, interesting. We have uh, asked the general practitioners uh, to, when the patient comes in, to say yes, what brings you here? And then for the last, for the first three minutes, they were not supposed to speak. The general petitioner. They could produce well noises, <laughs> but no more than that. And uh, then we asked the patients as they were coming out, how was the interview? The interviews at that time uh, were. You must take this into account. The, that normally a general practitioner at the time after the when I was working with this was approximately thirty patients, thirty to fifty patients every two hours. So very short time. But when the patients came out, we asked them how was it. They said they've never been advised so well as today. That was the general comment, and it was no more than making people shut up, listen for a while. And I think that's so very difficult for for, uh, and you have to train it early on. I, that I would think is the central part for increasing the relation, improving the relationship between doctors and patients as they go on. Once they have, so to say, uh, already all made, it's very difficult to uh, to change them because they know everything. So it's very difficult to change them. So you have to steal their students from them and teach them secretly. <laughs> <laughs>
You importantly highlighted that with a progressively aging population, physicians will need to become more increasingly confident in working with you know, patients with mental and physical health comorbidities. Um, I think an, an additional consequence of an aging population and a declining birth rate is increasing stress on the young. Um, so you know, to support uh, you know, a growing post-retirement portion of the, the population. Um, and I think combined with you know, sort of increasing expectations and higher levels of education to, to enter the, to work, the workforce, at, for instance. So I'm curious about how you think about physicians' roles also in working with younger and working age uh, individuals with that. And the individual and the big question. What is the question specifically? So spe specifically, the consequence is that there's going to be increasing stress, I think, also on younger individuals entering the labor force to support a progressively, you know, post-retirement portion of, of the population and the mental health implications of that. Um, and so I'm curious how you think about psychiatrists' role in working with sort of younger well, individuals. I think that uh, to start with, I think that the uh, one of the consequences of the Second World War uh, or rather the pre preparation for the Second World War, was the massive flight of psychoanalysts from Germany to New York. And uh, they have come here and they've infested the rest of the uh, territory, the rest of psychiatry by psychoanalysis mm -hmm. and concepts that are related to it. And they're still surviving in this way. Um, and I think it was not very, it was helpful at the time, but as time went by, it became less and less helpful. I think today we gradually have understood that psychiatrist is not a miracle maker, he's not a philosopher, he's not a somebody who can predict future future, future or understand the past better than it was. He's a medical doctor. And as a medical doctor, he has to deal with a problem that the person has, understanding the person, understanding the situation in which the person lives, give advice that is reasonable, etc. A number of things that have been sort of wiped out of the psychiatric activities for a long time, wrongly. And I think that's something which we have to reintroduce into psychiatry if you want it to be a useful discipline. Uh, because what we are doing now, what we're seeing in psychiatry very often, is not useful to anybody but the psychiatrist. Mm. They are, they are, I mean, they feel very good about what they're doing, but they are not particularly useful uh, in that. Uh, I mean, God is helping that many people recover spontaneously. So that uh, is a great help for them. But in fact, one has to really think twice. And, Many of the things like knowing where your limits are and knowing what the limits of the person are in front of you and thinking in, in very practical terms, giving a reasonable advice to a person is sometimes more important than a medical opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of these things probably have been neglected in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so like you mentioned before that the world has been increasingly fragmented, also alienated from the works of labor. Do you see this helping the efforts of reducing stigma or harming? Um, do you see like an increase of stigmatization of mental illness because of alienation? Or do you see it kind of helping because more people are like depressed, burned out, so they're more <laughs> likely to understand someone with mental illness? I think that there are two factors which are important. The one factor is the stigma and its consequences. Mm -hmm. And the other factor is the compensating factors. Mm -hmm. So uh, stigma will have worse consequences if you remove some of the other things. Mm -hmm. If you remove, for example, uh, an understanding family from the person, stigma will be worse. So even if stigma remains stable in its strengths, depending on what happens in the society, it will become more important or less important. Mm -hmm. So that it's not stigma alone. By killing, by killing stigma alone, we will not be there where we would like to be. We have to really think of what is happening in society in general. Is it likely now that people will help each other anyway? and not relation to this particular stigmatized person? Or is it that they are less likely and less willing to help one another? in which case stigma becomes even more noxious than it was to be. So I think that stigma cannot be considered in, in absence of the factors of human relations in a particular society. Stigma is just one of the many uh, uh, things. We, we, many people carry various types of stigma, uh, depending on what they are, but it's the, the rest of the relationship between people which you have to keep in mind. So. If you ask me whether stigma has become worse now than it has become before, yes. But it's not because stigma is worse, 
is because of many of the other things which are compensating against the consequence of stigma have disappeared. Mm -hmm. Throughout your talk, I kept thinking that this is not a talk about a psychiatry, a future of psychiatry. It's a talk about a different revamping of foundations of society and the whole, <laughs> like values, all of, because psychiatry is only one aspect of it and they're a product of their society in which they were raised. And then my, my, I, the, the next question I kept thinking is, so where do we begin? And then throughout the talk, you kept talking about different training, different type of education, but then I go back to the same like values of what the training is motivated by certain values that we help, they're held in the and recognized in society. Our current values in this society, at least in the United States, are productivity, progress, money. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we see the education we have. And that's why certain things are doctors are fragmented and urbanization, all these aspects that you mentioned. So I guess my big question, and it's not something, I don't know, who knows the answer to it, is like, what's the model? Is there, a, where do we look? How do we begin? How do we integrate the, the value of, again, slowing down and caring about each other? Well, what is within our power, uh, many of yourselves, is... Uh, many of you have teaching responsibilities. And I think that these teaching responsibilities offer an opportunity to do something uh, which may change the person when he comes out of your teaching. And I think that it is in the training, starting from the training in elementary school to various other. So if I were to fight for something, I would be fighting for improving the conditions under which people are trained, uh, the trainers are trained, and to what an extent teachers are being given more respect, more money, more opportunities, etc. And I think that I would also put at the same time in medical school, I would not select people because they have published many papers, because these papers are useless for the treatment of the bed. I would select them because they are good people. And you, you imitate. I mean, you, this doctor is doing this way. I, I, I like this. I would like to do the same. And I think that at present we have this emphasis, ah, oh, you cannot become a professor because he has a little, published 75 papers and started such a journal. It's nonsense. Most of those who write so much don't have time to be human. It's no time. I mean, you have to do something. No matter how long to do it. And you don't know. I'm, not, I'm exaggerating. But and not too much. I think that really the secret or rather the, which I think the, uh, the solution to the problem is in the change of the process of education which means we have to think of different ways of hiring people who will teach. We have to reward different things in the teaching. We have to think of ways in which we can uh, uh, make the uh, process of growing a more healthy and more useful way. That is, I would think, is one of the big areas where we can do a change. The other one is by money. If you have enough money, uh, you can, in fact, introduce things later in life, uh, etc. So by special arrangements or different types of services or, uh, I don't know, taking your patient for a holiday for a fortnight to, to, to Italy to come back again. I mean, during these 14 days, you will have wonderful time. With it. So there are many things, but that's not within everybody's reach. What is within every one of us reach is three training others, uh, teaching other people what to do and be making people aware of the, for example, I was recently trying to see whether people have learned about what is called the registers of communication. And uh, um, you know, what the hell is this? And yet that is a, a, a terribly important thing. I, I, I remember when I was a young doctor, um, my uh, teacher at the time, he uh, had a habit, which I 10 years later understood was very important. He, the patient would come through the door. He would see him, he would do everything. Then when the interview was over, he would go out, he would open the door, put the hand around the shoulder of the patient, and say, in general, how goes it? And here the patient opened up and completely a different world, which suddenly became open. And I, I learned at the time that how important it is to, to, to open, to understand that when you are speaking with a patient, you are in a patient-doctor relationship. 
and the, doc, the patient has a certain idea of what he may or may not tell you during that in uh, relationship. And when you now change the relationship as if it was your brother or friend, he suddenly comes out with other information, which however is more important for the treatment than the one which you got in the first register. And I think that having a, is one of the things that one should teach students from the day one. That is how you do it. I mean, how you understand the patient's position proficiently to give him advice, which may be helpful. Yeah. Oh, you're you're no, so you can please take our last question. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, uh, so as someone who wants to be a future psychiatrist and a future adolescent psychiatrist, uh, you talked a little bit about horizontalization. I see this. I'm a young adult, um, <laughs> where people tend to be more comfortable talking with people their own age, and then when they go to the doctor, they'll leave certain things out. Either when you're, you're really young, you're worried that a uh, therapist would tell like your parents that you feel sad or something like that, and especially if you're in like a not safe home environment. Um, but I was wondering if you had any positions, ideas, or experience on how we could work to kind of like bridge that gap, especially when you're like an adolescent talking, like when you're an adult talking to your therapist or psychiatrist, you're two adults talking in a room. So there, there is the doctor patient gap, but it's a little bit closer than I think than an adolescent talking to, because not only is there not the doctor patient gap, there's the adult, not adult gap. So what are your ideas on how we could work to bridge that gap? Well, you have to remember that adolescence is an invention of the last 30 years. It never existed, never. I, when I was a boy, I was an adolescent. You were a child and then you were an adult. This extraordinary period of 15 years of without any social responsibility. You just go there, you, you listen to your teachers and then they tell something, yes, you learn something. I mean, you don't have any social responsibility at all. In, in my age, uh, in, in, when I was a boy, with uh, 13 years of age, you started working. Half the world today has no idea what adolescence might be. You are excused. You don't have to do anything at home because you're studying. When you are adolescent, you can do things which others are not allowed to do. And the, the invention of adolescence is recent. And therefore, our knowledge about how to handle it is also relatively poor. And we find great difficulties of thinking of how to influence an adolescent who is really in this limbo between being a member of society and being a child, which are very different roles. And he is neither a child nor an adult. So you can't use him, you can't work with him using the model of working with the elder, with the or, or adults, nor with the child model, because he's neither. And we don't really know what to do it. So I think that as time goes by, we'll probably learn how to deal with adolescents. But for the moment, I think that some of the things which have been done over the years by many people is really trying to learn as much as possible about what are the prevailing values in a group of adolescents. They seem to be very different from one country to another, but also from one town to another and from one group to another. So learning about this unknown world is probably the first step that we should take. The treatment itself is not particularly uh, different from any other age, but the relationship which you want to establish and the understanding is very different and requires much more time listening and trying to understand what do they mean when they say such a thing? Uh, what do they mean when they say this? Because they mean different things from what you think. Uh, and uh, the, the wonderful work that Osgood has done with his semantic differential, uh, looking at different, what they call it, semantic spheres, I don't know whether you've been working on this, in which you take a word that you say, and then you use the same word from the uh, adolescent, and you see what are the uh, attributes of that particular word in both of you, and you will find that the overlap between the two semantic spheres is minimal. And as you go along, you might learn how to increase the overlap because then suddenly you will start understanding what they're saying to you and what they're doing. So I think it's it's probably for adolescent psychiatry in particular, the main effort is to try to understand what is wrong with this person because he's not only having a disease, he's also from a different planet. <laughs> from you. Uh, so you have to understand where, what is his values, what I, where does he want to be, what does he do, etc. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Many of you have children of that age, and you 
maybe have learned something about them or from them, but many of them people have uh, in fact learned nothing and they're happy that these children have grown up. So now I know it's like me. But uh, it's the, the period which is almost incomprehensible and never been described in the history of the world in the last century. Well, <laughs> thank you.